as a starting point for examining the sixth song from Rough and Rowdy Way's Mother of Muses, let's hear what it was like when Bob Dylan was announced as the Nobel Prize winner in literature. Nobel Prize in Literature, year 2016, Bob Dylan. Pretty raucous as far as uh, Nobel ceremonies go, but that moment may have given birth to this song here. Well, to be more precise, the moment might have been when he was handed the medal. Sarah Denius, secretary of the Swedish Academy, said that when Dylan first received the medal, quote, When he had the golden medal in his hand, he turned the backside up, looked at it for a long time, and seemed amazed. This is that medal, and this is what he was amazed by, right? The sight of a poet receiving inspiration from a muse. That inscription that you see going around the medal in Latin basically says, It is beneficial to have improved life through art. That being a quotation from Virgil's Aeneid. Uh, not verbatim, by the way. Anyway, this seems to be the seed of the song Mother of Muses. So who was the mother of muses? Well, here she is, uh, Nemesine, sorry about pronunciation, who was the mother of all of the muses. The muses, of course, being the ones that inspired creativity in humans, whether it be a poet uh, or even a scientist. But back to poetry, uh, Nemesine was particularly called upon by poets before they would recite their lines. Of course, we remember this from uh, the Odyssey and the Iliad, both of which start by invoking a goddess or muse. Sing in me, O muse. And this is something Dylan was definitely aware of, because in his Nobel lecture, he quoted the beginning of the Odyssey. And now let's get to the song itself. How about some stats? It's uh, 294 words, 30 lines, 6 stanzas. It uses 15 different rhyming sounds. It sticks to a nice, simple A-A-B-B -B rhyme scheme. And it starts, Mother of Muses, sing for me. Sing of the mountains and the deep dark sea. Sing of the lakes and the nymphs in the forest. Sing your hearts out, all you women of the chorus. Sing of honor and fame and of glory to be. Mother of Muses, sing for me. And that really gives the listener a preview of everything they're going to hear in the rest of the song. It's dripping with classical Greek, uh, you know, vibes. Uh, we have the Mother of Muses, we have nymphs, we have the chorus, which of course calls to mind, you know, the ancient Greek chorus as seen here. But it was very noticeable. There's also talk about heroes and glory. That is the duality that this song is based on. The Greek stuff, if you will, and heroes and glory. And it's a really interesting mix there. Not an intuitive one. What's Dylan going for? Well, actually, there's something I want to point out first. Uh, mother of Muses. M-O-M. -M, mom. And he's singing the song to the mother, the mom of Muses. So, thought that was a little bit clever. And also... Calls to mind what Bob, B-O-B, -B, did all the way back in 1966 with the album title Blonde on Blonde. Let's get back into the lyrics to find out. Uh, so we'll look at the second and third stanza. Mother of muses, sing for my heart. Sing for a love too soon to depart. Sing of the heroes who stood lone, whose names are engraved on tablets of stone who struggled with pain so the world could go free, Mother of Muses, sing for me. So, again, back to the heroic note. And don't worry, I won't read out the next stanza, but let's just look at the cast of characters that he has in there. We start with an international list of generals who fought against Nazis and the Confederacy. Then we have Elvis Presley and Martin Luther King. First, though, here's a gallery of the generals in the same order that they appear in the lyrics, but I'm not going to comment on the individuals. Instead, let's ponder how these men paved the way for Elvis and Martin Luther King. Well, both the Nazis and the Confederacy were firmly in the anti-freedom camp, right? This is part of, you know, liberal democracy winning out in the 20th century and also leading up to the 20th century, basically establishing a free society where you're free to do what you want, including picking up a guitar in the post-World War II era and becoming a rock star, one of the original rock stars, or fighting against the leftovers of the battle 
with the Confederacy, right? Jim Crow, segregation, all of that. Or, as the lyrics say, who cleared the path for Presley to sing, who carved out the path for Martin Luther King? What then might be somewhat overlooked in the commentaries on this song is that Dylan is obviously placing himself clearly as a poet, appealing to the muse for inspiration to sing about heroes in the exact same way that that was done before. Because it's not just, oh, he starts off by invoking the muse just like Homer did. No, Homer did that before singing about the heroes, the word hero coming from the ancient Greek world, no less, right? And a hero back then being an Achilles or a Hercules, someone like that. A hero in the ancient Greek world was by definition a demigod. But General Patton, Elvis Presley, Martin Luther King, all the names that he rattled off, they were all very much mortal men. Therefore, in casting himself as the modern Homer, which is actually what Dylan does here, and actually what he's hinted at and done elsewhere, too, outside of this song, um, he's updating the role because a modern Homer's role is going to be to sing about real world heroes who are actually fully fleshed human beings and not mythical demigods. But he starts by still invoking the help of the goddess. And now let's catch up on the end of this section here. Who did what they did and then went on their way. Man, I could tell their stories all day. But wait, because here's where it gets really meta and in more than one way. Bob Dylan does tell their stories, right? He's a storyteller. And his lyrics are absolutely infused with Civil War references and things like that. Uh, and, you know, he was known as the Troubadour for a reason. But as far as this song goes, he's also one of the characters in the story that he's telling. Because if Elvis is one of these people that is worthy of mention, so is Bob Dylan. He's definitely one of the predominant figures of the latter half of the 20th century, right? Right up there with Elvis and whoever else you want to name. And not just in terms of music. I mean, he's just one of the notable people of that period in American history. He's a cultural giant, second to none, but he's also one of the ones who benefited from that free world that was created, the world that allows you to do whatever you want. Pretty interesting, and let's continue with the song. We're halfway through. I'm falling in love with Calliope. Calliope, by the way, in myth, was one of the muses. So remember, he's singing to the mother of muses. Now he's singing about one of those mother's daughters, Calliope makes sense as the muse Dylan would fall in love with because she was the muse of epic poetry as well as song and music so there you go how perfect can you get next line she doesn't belong to anybody why not give her to me Calliope was known as the feistiest of the muses so that might be what that's referencing to her independence here is a depiction of her as you can imagine She's speaking to me, speaking with her eyes. I've grown so tired of chasing lies. Mother of muses, wherever you are, I've already outlived my life by far. A little side note, the line about I've grown so tired of chasing lies reminds me of when Bruce Springsteen one time brought Dylan up on stage and nobody knew that was going to happen. He started by addressing his audience and saying, searching for truth is the American way. Bob Dylan taught me that. And we certainly can't avoid the interpretation that that final line about outliving his life is self-referential. He knows he's closer to the end than the beginning of life. That might naturally make us think about the other musical greats, his contemporaries and friends who've already passed, uh, and later in the song we'll get confirmation that maybe that's on his mind. Penultimate stanza, Mother of Muses, unleash your wrath. Things I can't see, they're blocking my path. Show me your wisdom, tell me my fate. Put me upright, make me walk straight. Forge my identity from the inside out. You know what I'm talking about. The beginning there about wrath, clearly an Iliad reference. I want to skip all the way down to the beginning of the final couplet in that section. Forge my identity from the inside out. Uh, reminds me of something he said that I thought was really profound. In recent years, it was in an interview, uh, he said, The point of life is not to find yourself, it's to create yourself. And that really fits, right? The whole song he's calling to the muses and the mother of muses, just the way that ancient poets would invoke them, but forge my identity. They helped him become the person and the artist that he is. And the bit about that mysterious line, you know what I'm talking about, 
you know, there's a very wink-wink quality there, because no, Bob, we don't. Uh, but it reminds me of something he said a long time ago, that his favorite artists are the ones who seem to know something you don't. I think he was talking about watching Buddy Holly play live when he said that. What are we looking at here? You're probably wondering. Well, it's a calliope. No one else pointed this out. It might just be a coincidence, but yeah, her name was also adopted to a musical instrument and one that has this very, you know, old school circus vibe, which as we know, Dylan is obsessed with. We know for a fact, as a songwriter, he's also a big fan of words that can have dual meaning. And he doesn't just use a word because it has a dual meaning, it's that both of them, at least in some way, usually in a more jokey way, the, the subversion, the B version, uh, both apply. Okay, final stanza. Take me to the river and release your charms. Let me lay down in your sweet love and arms. Wake me, shake me, free me from sin. Make me invisible like the wind. Got a mind to ramble, got a mind to roam. I'm traveling light and I'm slow coming home. Take me to the river might be an Al Green reference, but it could also be a Talking Heads reference. Either way, I've talked about this so much, he always has a hint that the song is coming back to the beginning, winding down, you know, completing the circle. This is the first natural landscape mention in the whole song since the start of the first stanza. Again, I've mentioned this before, but yeah, you don't get the standard pop songwriting convention. Oh, here's the bridge. Okay, well, clearly the song is, you know, about to wrap up. And Dylan's often, but not always, have this quality where you can't tell when they're going to end. And this is something he plays with even in live performances. Like when he was on Letterman's final show, it's a really big deal. And look at his band. You can tell they didn't know when he was going to end the song. But lyrically, he does it, so it's in a much more subtle way. But yeah, his songs might have this very steady rhythm, and you're just not sure how long it's going to go. This was one of the defining characteristics of Like a Rolling Stone, and it blew people's minds. Uh, I think it was Paul McCartney who said, you know, so beautiful, and it just kept going. He sometimes blows right past your expectation of when a song is supposed to end. And sometimes, like here, he kind of does the opposite still subverting the expectation, though, about when a song should end. Anyway, uh, this last bit has lots of possible musical allusions uh, to Etta James with Love in Arms. Wake Me, Shake Me probably references uh, a project that his friend Al Cooper, speaking of Like a Rolling Stone, uh, was on, the 1966 The Blues Project, and then it's all but certain that there's multiple Leonard Cohen references here in the final line. Dylan seems to be name-checking the last three albums of his friend, one of the all-time great songwriters himself, uh, last three albums before he died in 2016. Which makes us go back to the thoughts of Dylan's mortality. I'm traveling light and I'm slow coming home. Slow coming home uh, makes us think of slow train coming, I would say anyway. But more importantly, uh, I'm once again taken to reference one of the interviews with Dylan, this was in the Scorsese doc, where he said, you know, he's born a long way from where he was supposed to be, so he's been returning home this whole time. So he's returning from where he started, and back to this song in particular, if he started, if we all started from some kind of divinity, that's who he's singing to in this song, and that's what he's returning back to. To his happy uh, reunion or marriage with Calliope, the very goddess that inspired him in the first place. As is almost always the case, a fascinating song and that pulls in, but this is really something he's stressed in recent years, this part of his career, that pulls in just a dizzying array of references. But everything has a purpose and a place. It's not just trying to show off, look how many different references and Easter eggs I can cram in here. Uh, sometimes songwriters try to copy Dylan when it comes to the real dense references, and it, it just comes off really uh, vapid. Sorry. Here it's all a part of this song's design, it seems to me, right? So, you know, obviously you have the muse, classical Greek, and hero aspect all moved into a modern setting where Dylan himself is the ancient poet, he is Homer, and his heroes are today's heroes, but not just that in general, it's not just some random you know, sports hero, no, it's the people who created the world that allowed artists like him to exist. And two, for whatever time he's alive, make music and enjoy it, and I think that's how the thoughts of mortality and references to other songs come into play at the very end. A perfect example of that is 
take me to the river. Yeah, possible Al Green and Talking Heads reference, but in the context of this song, clearly also a reference to the river Styx. Where the ultimate ancient Greek hero seen here, Achilles, tragic hero, was taken by his mother. She took him there to dip him in so he would be almost impervious so that he could be glorious in battle. And remember that Achilles was offered a choice before he lived his life. Would he have a long, safe life or a glorious one, a famous one? He chose the latter. And think back to our very first stanza, sing of honor and fame and of glory. Honor, fame, and glory being things that Dylan has had no uh, lack of in his life. And Dylan is thinking back on his life. He's remembering, and by the way, Nemocene wasn't just the mother of the muses, she was the goddess of memory. And in looking back, he's remembering how he was in a position to live this glorious artistic life. And that's why this song spares a moment to remember people like General Sherman. There it is, Mother of Muses. Thanks for listening.